Ati, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen okay, Ati? Yes. Okay. So this is a patient, young patient. Uh, she had had a cholecystectomy three weeks before this scan at an outside hospital. So pre-operative imaging just showed mild CBD dilatation and a two millimeter stone at the ampulla and lots of gallstones. So the presumed diagnosis at that time was cholelithiasis, cholidocholithiasis, and I looked through the outside reports, CT reports, they didn't comment on anything else. So three weeks later, she showed up in our ED with jaundice, abdominal pain, and the findings are not hard to pick up, but I thought the histology on this was very interesting. So I let people see what, what the problem was. So few findings in the pelvis, majority of the findings in the upper abdomen. I'm seeing a hilar mass right. um, causing biliary obstruction and then the bile duct comes back. Yeah, exactly. Um, and all the fat planes in the hilum are lost. It's interfacing with both parts of the portal, uh, both the right and left portal vein. And then I saw some masses in the pelvis, which I'm presuming are related and or met. That's the gallbladder fossa. Okay, yep. So soft tissue rind over there. And then as you rightly said, obstructing hilar mass, upstream biliary dilatation. And then what do we think of this hydro? We follow it down. Kind of lost the ureter somewhere which we presumed was because of these pelvic masses probably arising from both ovaries, right? Yes. Um, and then one other organ. Stomach? Yeah. Yeah, looks like linitis. Mm. So we raised concerns for all this. And then at that point, they went back and looked at the path specimen from the gallbladder. And sure enough, they said that there was a gallbladder malignancy. So then we did an MR to further confirm these findings. And MR again shows the same findings, I think on the diffusion weighted images, we nicely see the hilar mass. We see these nodes around. We see that soft tissue in the gallbladder fossa itself and the nice diffusion restriction throughout the stomach. But we didn't get pelvis images, but MRCP again confirmed the same findings. These are delayed axial images showing the enhancing mass. So when we suggested that the stomach was probably going to be infiltrative tumor, at first they were really not sure. So they did an endoscopy and biopsy and that came back negative. It just showed some helicobacter pylori and non-specific inflammation. But um, we discussed the case again with the GI folks and said, we really think this is infiltrative tumor, the way it restricts and the way the fold pattern is lost. So they went back and did a stomach biopsy again. This time they did a deep, full thickness punch biopsy of the wall and sure enough, that came back malignancy. So what was interesting on this was the histopath. So it turned out to be a cholangiocarcinoma, but it turned out to be what's called a signet ring cell variant of cholangiocarcinoma. So we're used to seeing the usual gland forming variant of adenocarcinoma, but sometimes due to some lack of gene expression, these cells actually cannot excrete the mucin out. So these cells trap the mucin in them and push the nucleus to one side, which is how you end up with those nice signet ring cells. So signet ring cells we're used to seeing in the stomach all the time, right? Breast can occasionally have signet ring cell tumors. But this was an interesting case because it was a cholangial, but it was a signet ring cell variant. And that explains why the stomach was infiltrated and looking back, I thought the ovary may even be like Krukenberg tumors, which can happen with signet rings of the stomach. It's just that in this case, the signet ring primary happens to be in the duct around the cholangium. So just unusual histology with stomach infiltration and Krukenbergs from what we thought was a hilar 
for Landry. I just had a few things to Rupa, share. that's crazy. Um, I've never seen a gallbladder met to the stomach like I that. I and I have a question. So you said the first EGD they did, they didn't get either a positive biopsy and it didn't look malignant. So it was just like infiltrating under the surface and you have Probably. to get like a deeper. They said they, on the pictures, they said the mucosa appeared like a cobblestone pattern and the fold pattern was lost. They said they didn't see the rugal folds as nicely as they're used to seeing. And they said there was edema and cobblestoning of the mucosa, which is why I wondered if it was all tumor cells just creeping submucosally. And then when they went back and did that full thickness sponge biopsy is when they found it. Interesting. So when these happen near the um, hilum, they are light clad skin, but it's, it's a very dreaded surgical tumor because they can never get an R0 resection compared to like the routine hyalocholangios we see. And then one interesting theory they had was if they happen in the distal CBD near the ampulla, this makes sense because you can have those ectopic gastric mucosal rests from where the signature ring cells came. So these were just few examples they had in the literature. These are those signet cells where the nucleus is pushed off to one side because the mucin cannot be excreted out. And the ones they showed around the distal CBD were all hyper enhancing. So very easy to call them like neuroendocrine tumors even. But what, what we need to remember is that cholangio can have different forms. There's a great article in radiographics which shows all these different variants of cholangio. And then never forget cholangio when you're seeing patients with recurrent pyogenic cholangitis or if they've had a cholidocal cyst excise even years ago, if that little bit of mucosa is left behind, it can become metaplastic. And then they showed examples of biliary papillomas and adenomas also turning into cholangio. So just an unusual presentation for cholangio. One question, Doc. So in our case, so the primary was uh, the, in the bile dog and then infiltrating. No, in, no, in Swachanda. So on the gallbladder specimen, when they went back and our pathologist looked at it, they commented that it was a gallbladder adenocarcinoma with signature cell features. So don't know if the primary was in the gallbladder, it then spread to the hilum or if the tumor was always in the hilum and it had gone to the gallbladder, but it was very incidentally discovered at surgery because she also happened to have gallstones and cholidocolithiasis. So the sign, another question, the, so the signature cell cancer, is it the same as mucinous adenocarcinoma or is it a variant no, of it? No, it's a way, it's a different variant. The mucin secreting is a different histologic variant. The signet ring is a different variant. Okay, thank you. Dan. Yeah. And it makes sense why it was sort of like creeping along because um, signet ring cell loves to like creep along like in the stomach and then maybe right. from the, the gallbladder or to the um, hilum and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and actually I've seen, you know, your hydronephrosis aspect. Um, I've seen cases where it basically creeps along the retroperitoneum and causes hydro without even a, you know, adnexal mass causing the hydro. And so whenever possible. I see a signet ring cell and I see hydro, I get really concerned that there's actually like retroperitoneal, like creeping disease, like along the ureter. Yeah. Hey, Mark Sugi, welcome. I hope you brought a case. Hi. Yeah, actually, no, I'm on, I'm on, um, Ultrasound, or I'm on the inpatient service, so I'm kind of in and out, but I wanted to log in and say hello. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay, I'm going to share next. Okay, this is a pelvic case. Um, this is a youngish woman. And um, what do you guys see? Large mixed solid cystic mass. Stained glass appearance. Kind of. Nice, nice. So um, we've got the uterus here. We've got this ovary. What do you guys think about this ovary? It's Left ovary. Enlarged, too many follicles. Yeah, yeah. So this actually, this patient has known PCOS. So this is a nice example of PCOS enlarged, kind of that um, expanded stroma, peripheralized follicles. And then this was the right ovary. So uh, Mark, what, what were you suggesting by stained glass? Uh, um, sometimes you can see it with like mucinous ovarian neoplasms, I think. Yep. So um, you can see that there's on, on the T1 pre, there's all these bright areas. And then the post contrast, 
Um, the non-bright areas were enhancing. So definitely solid mass with, I don't know, either hemorrhagic or mucinous components. Um, so one thing I wanted to show you guys was ORADS. So this is the ORADS calculator. And um, you, you first you say, is there peritoneal disease? No. Um, is it a hemorrhagic cyst? No. Um, is there fat? No. Is there solid enhancing part? Yes. Um, and then I thought this part was really interesting. So my lesion, they say, um, you know, is it really dark? If it's homogeneously dark, then you're thinking it could be a fibrothecoma and it's actually a ORADS2, low risk of malignancy. If some is dark and some is non-dark, um, it actually is an intermediate. And actually my lesion ends up, uh, actually it ends up in this, all of it is non-dark and signal because none of it was really, really dark, like um, as dark as a muscle. So my lesion is there. And then this is the interesting part. It says, what is the best enhancement? And if we go back to the lesion, they're asking you, if you don't do DCE, they're asking you for the enhancement compared to the myometrium. And in this case, you can see that it's hypo-enhancing compared to the myometrium. So when you put that in there, hypo-enhancing, um, it ends up being an ORADS4. So I thought this was interesting because I thought, you know, this is a definite solid cystic mass. It should be an ORADS5, definite lesion. But, um, but for some reason in ORADS, it, it's an intermediate risk, 50% risk of malignancy. So I, I guess there are some mimics like this. Um, the fact that it's not enhancing more than the myometrium uh, means that it's not, you know, as high of a risk of malignancy as, as some other tumors. Do you guys have any comments about that? Anyone ORADS experts out there? Oops. Okay. Well, anyway, I will, um, I'll just cut to the chase. So this was resected and this turned out to be a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor, um, which is one of the sex cord stromal tumors. So just one little um, review about ovarian tumors. Um, about 70% of them are going to be epithelial tumors like serous and mucinous. These are the most common ones that we see either being like a large cystic neoplasm with a solid component. 20% um, are gonna be germ cell tumors like teratomas and then all these mixed ones. Um, a smaller percent, five to 10% are sex cord stromal tumors. So these can be granulosa cell tumors, um, either juvenile, which secretes estrogen and causes precocious puberty or the fibroma, the coma, which are on the benign spectrum and would qualify as ORADS2. Um, and actually in the sex cord stromal tumor, there's also Sertoli Leydig cell, um, which is what my tumor ended up being. And then finally, don't forget about metastases um, like cucumber tumors, for example, from, from gastric cancer. So just going back to my case, um, I don't think there's anything very specific. I tried to look in the literature to see like, is there something that I could have said? I mean, this doesn't really look like my most classic like serous, but I think it's, you know, it's concerning enough, it's a surgical lesion, um, and it turned out to be a sertoli Leydig cell tumor, but these are very rare tumors. They're less than 5% of ovarian tumors. They secrete testosterone. So this patient's testosterone level was extremely high. And between that and the um, PCOS, they actually had some um, hirsutism and also weren't having normal periods. Um, and actually this one was a malignant sertoli Leydig cell tumor with um, intestinal di differentiation and adenocarcinoma within it. So um, I guess my summary is, um, you know, there are all these different types of ovarian tumors. Um, don't forget about the sex cord stromal tumors, the benign ones are the fibrothecomas, um, but the granulosa cell tumors secrete estrogen and the Sertoli Leydig cell tumors secrete testosterone and can be malignant. Nice. Arti, is having PCOS a risk factor or the result of excessive testosterone? Hmm. I don't know. I thought they were unrelated, but oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, when you say if it's secondary to it, yeah, maybe it could be secondary to it because if your horm hormones are all off, maybe it could, you know, change your whole pathway. Okay. My next case. Uh, I have a question, Doc. Uh, not only related to like ovarian malignancy, but all the pelvic malignancy. When we report the uh, lymph nodes, like metast 
you know, like the involved lymph node, do you or do we separately mention whether these lymph nodes are local regional lymph node versus metastatic lymph nodes, or we just mention the uh, you know, like lymph nodes in these locations and do not mention specifically if these represent metastatic lymph nodes? Um, to be honest, I've mostly seen ovarian tumors cause peritoneal disease, not nodal lymph, lymphatic nodal disease, um, which is why I think ORADS, hold on, let me bring it back up again. Um, the calculator. It's asking if there's peritoneal or mental nodularity with or without ascites. Um, there's nothing about lymph nodes here. So, and that's been my experience where I think it, it much more likely goes to the peritoneal cavity. I haven't actually seen it going to the lymph node. So I, I haven't, I, you know, if I, if I saw that happening, I would, I guess I'd have to look up the staging more, but um, I haven't seen that happening. Yeah, Whereas yeah, with yeah. endometrial cervical cancer and everything, I've seen it go into the lymph nodes. Yeah, my question was like general in all the pelvic malignancies, for example, or even like rectal malignancy, if we see a inguinal lymph node, then, you know, like, what do we see? Like, is it a, a local lymph node or we just say like we see inguinal lymph node or we say this is a metastatic lymph node in this context? Do, do we? Oh, it, it really depends on the tumor. So for example, for rectal cancer, um, if you have an anal, if it's really low and it's anal, like in, involving the anal canal, then an inguinal lymph node can be local. Whereas if it's a high rectal tumor, then an inguinal lymph node would be a metastatic node. I think you have to mention it in the report. Uh, the SARDFP has that. So yeah. you, uh, like Arti said, in the, it depends on which tumor you're talking about. So. Yeah, got you. Thank you, Dave. Okay. This is my next one. So what um, surgery has this patient undergone? There's a lot of clips here. Renal and pancreas. Yes, good. So anytime you see a renal transplant in the left lower quadrant, normally they put them in the right lower quadrant because there's more space, less sigmoid colon, less um, diverticulitis happening there. But when you see it in the left lower quadrant, that usually means that they've either had a prior failed one here or they did also a pancreas transplant. And you can see that there's this fluffy thing here. So this is actually a pancreas transplant. And um, there was some elevated amylase patient had abdominal pain. And so there was some stranding in this region. Um, but also this is a non-contrast exam and there were some, you know, these are vessels. So we said this could be pancreatitis, but you know, given that it's around the vessels, we need to get an ultrasound to uh, make sure the vessels are open, which they were. Uh, but the cool part about this case also is, here's my pancreas transplant. And then here is, um, the cool part of the case. So what is the pancreas transplant connected to? It's connected to the bladder? Yeah. Yeah, Mark says bladder. Yes, so this is the duodenal C-sweep that they resect with the pancreas. And here it is connected to the bladder. So um, turns out this pancreas transplant is actually 25 years old. Um, so this is like in the early days of pancreas, pancreatic transplantation, and they used to connect the, um, the, the duodenum to the bladder. Um, this causes issues with the bladder. You know, the, the enzymes are basically going into the bladder. So it causes two issues. One, you're, um, you get alkaline cystitis. Um, it causes irritation of the bladder. And also um, nowadays they'll, they will connect the duodenal C-sweep to a piece of jejunum. So you'll actually still be able to use some of your pancreatic enzymes for your digestion. Whereas if it's going into the bladder, obviously you're not, you're not going to be able to use it. So, um, just interesting. I, I had only seen it like in online in the literature that they used to connect it to the bladder, but, um, and now I have a case of it. So anyway, you can see that the, the connection there and actually it's a pretty example of a pancreas transplant. A lot of times they're just kind of crumpled up. So it looks like a ball. Okay. This is my next case. Okay. 
another pelvic mass case. So I'll, um, the uterus is here. There's a pelvic mass here. And there's another finding. Is there a colonic mass on the right? Yes. So this is um, thickening of the col ascending colon. And some of it is even kind of extending beyond the wall of the colon to this area here. So um, what do you think about? And then this, I'll tell you, it was just the right ovary. So are your thoughts that this is an ovarian mass that's metastasized to the colon, a colon mass metastasized to the ovary, two separate things? Maybe primary is ovary. Okay, so um, good, good thought. So that's kind of why I wanted to show this case because you might think that would be your first instinct because it's so much bigger than the colon mass. Um, but, and I was asking Nelly about this because um, she showed a case where there was a colon lesion and then there was an ovarian mass uh, um, and the ovarian mass turned out to be a mucinous carcinoma. And they said in the setting of a colon mass, that mucinous cancer is of the ovaries always presumed to be the metastasis from the colon. This was not mucinous. This was just an adenocarcinoma of the colon. So they did um, a, a, a colonoscopy. This, they got colonic adenocarcinoma um, and it was extending beyond the wall. And then they ended up actually because um, they, the, eventually this was causing a bowel obstruction. So they ended up going in and also resecting this ovarian mass. And this ovarian mass was also colon adenocarcinoma. So I guess the teaching point here is that if you have a colon lesion and an ovarian mass, um, if it's mucinous, then it's definitely the MET, but even if it's an adenocarcinoma and um, even if the ovarian mass looks much bigger than the colon primary, um, you can still, that can happen. So don't just hang your hat on the fact that like the ovarian mass is huge, therefore must be the primary. Okay, now that I've shown you this, actually, after, because I saw Nellie's case, when I saw this case, I said, I think this, um, this is a primary colon and the, this is the MET. Um, and I learned from this conference. So, There's your sag, and then I mean, sorry, axials, and then here's your uh, sag. And the cloboids, mm -hmm. cloboids in the uterus, AVM. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So here's your coronals, uh, and then this is your angios. Wow. Okay. Isn't it's that so beautiful? Uh, okay, where's my Radiopedia page so I can share information about AVMs? Um, <clears throat> uterine AVMs. Uh, so we know like DNCs prior, uh, I mean, really any procedures, right? C-sections, <clears throat> um, patients who've had multiple pregnancies are risk factors. Uh, and they, you can, so those are usually acquired. Um, and then you can also get uterine, congenital uh, uterine AVMs uh, that have multiple feeding arteries, a central nidus, uh, and MRI, you can diagnose it non-invasively, uh, typically ultrasound or MR, and you see flavoids like Arthi said in the endometrial cav cavity. Um, and patients, once it's diagnosed, and they can go on to get um, arterial em embo uh, to kind of address and treat these cases. Uh, so to me, I think T2 is actually really nice. And for me personally, I, I prefer, I, I think I could see it better on T2 than I can actually on um, the post-con images uh, because the flow weights are so beautiful and makes it so much easier. But let me share it with you, just the arterial, I mean, the dynamics. <laughs> so here's arterial, here's, uh, sorry, that was 20 seconds. This is 60 seconds. I don't really think those delay phases are very helpful at all. And I, I thought T2 for me was the best. 
Yeah. You really can't see it here. It's like really hard, super hard. But then on the tattoo, it just pops right out. That's my case. All right. So this is a uh, young female. She came into the ER, right lower quadrant pain. Um, it was kind of a fever, um, white count, concern for appendicitis was the initial order. Um, so this is our CT uh, at presentation. And so you can see here the appendix. Can you double click on it so that I it, can, sure. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Is she having any um, like symptoms of PID? So that was uh, that was the concern. Um, it was you know, at least when they ordered it, it was a rule out appendicitis, but also she was having, you know, fever, white count and pelvic pain. So that was- um, Yeah, the right side reminds me of like an abscess. It looks okay. complex, so that, but not necessarily a mass. So that's how, um, that was our thoughts as well at the time. They got an ultrasound uh, shortly thereafter, which, um, at that point, that looks we, a little bit more like a mass. A bit, <laughs> that looks more like a mass. A little bit more. And then uh, this is now um, progressing forward. She's been on antibiotics. Um, this is uh, a little bit later. Continues to be, you know, symptomatic. Um, at this time, we were worried about uh, possibly, you know, at this point, we were worried about either progression of a TOA versus um, a mass uh, IR. Wait, what's actually, the time difference between those two CDs? Uh, about a month. Got it. And then um, she ended up having IR place a drain or they had IR place a drain at that time in which they got out um, 200 mils of what they described as Frank pus, but it did not grow anything on culture. It was not sent for cytology. So now um, I looked at this CT another month later um, in which despite the drain and despite IV antibiotics, it did not get better. Um, and this did turn out to be um, endometrioid, endometrial carcinoma with involvement of the right ovary. It was not an abscess. Yeah. That endometrium did look a little like expanded and funky it, even from the beginning. Yeah, it it does, um, and I think the yeah one of the, I think the clinical history threw us off a little bit, and then also the IR drain getting out pus um, threw us off as well. Many of the uh, primary endometrioid tumors of the ovary arise from endometriosis, so it could have been infected endometriosis at the time. You know, mm -hmm. putting two things together. Yeah, I think good thought. It's uh, this. This looks really um, rapidly growing. Is it? Is it usually this aggressive? Does anyone know? Um, usually not. Um, yeah, I wonder if superimposed maybe infection. Maybe they did. You know, maybe they get infected at some point. Interesting. Thanks, Josh. Um, mm -hmm. Nelly, you're back up. Um, so this is another case, uh, companion case to the case that I showed earlier of uh, uterine AVM, but an ultrasound version. Uh, this one is um, history of spontaneous um, miscarriage uh, and status with DNC. It's a really pretty ultrasound image that was confirmed later on in MR, uh, MRA pelvis. That's it. Very nice. I, when I, I presented one of these a few weeks ago and it was um, also like to distinguish it from RPOCs that this is like clearly like centered in the myometrium versus like an expanded endometrial lesion with this much vascularity. Okay, um, Josh, you're back up. Okay, so this is a little bit of a companion case. Um, this is another young female came with uh, left lower quadrant pain to the ER.
graphics for you. She had been seen at an outside hospital first before coming to RER, in which she was told she had bilateral um, adnexal masses and pelvic lymphadenopathy. At this point, her only complaints were pain and distension. On the left, it looks like it's there's a lead mass of torsion on the left of Nexa. Very good. Right there is the torso ovary. And then there's all that lymphadenopathy, so which is a little weird for like I was just saying for ovarian masses, maybe, and oh, there's huge lymphadenopathy. Like, is there lymphoma and yeah. involving the ovary that led to the torsion? And then on the right side, that's a fibroid. Yeah, very good. So um, we were concerned. I, I didn't pick up the torsion here. I picked up that there was this, what I thought was a part solid in cystic mass um, as well as the lymphadenopathy, but it was odd that the lymphadenopathy was on the opposite side of, um, you know, the ovarian pathology. And so um, they went to surgery for this and uh, this ended up, let me pull up the path real quick. It ended up being um, a hemor hemorrhage and necrosis from torsion of the ovary uh, with a serous cystadenofibroma. And then the right-sided lymph nodes that they took ended up being follicular lymphoma. Wow. Yeah. yeah, so, so the, lead, the lead mass is that big cystic thing. So it's yeah. what, it torqued the ovary. Yeah. You, you could see the lead mass is, you know, way up high. That one, that's, that's mm -hmm. not, yeah, that's not a lymphoma. That's the lead mass and it twisted it. Just ironic. But, had but it was a cyst adenofibroma, right? So the solid part in the bottom is the cyst adenofibroma? The solid oh. part is the torus ovary, right? Yeah. There, but it also had a cyst adenofibroma. It did. It had it had both. So yeah, it had a cystadenofibroma, and then it torsed in necrosis, the uh, hemorrhage and necrosis within the ovary. Yeah. So cystadenofibromas can be completely cystic with just the lining being the fibrous component, um, with the black sponge appearance. It doesn't have a, to have a big fibrous component, but you could see that huge thing could be whatever serous cystadenoma, serous cystadenofibroma. But that you could see the torque right there underneath the cyst. That's the fulcrum. And then the ovary is below. It's the ovary is like that heart shape. So yeah. it's it is, is enlarged just cut from all the edema? The what? It's enlarged just from all the edema and the venous engorgement? The, the, the heart shaped ovary? No, it's just, it's 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 dead hemorrhagic infarct. I mean that's so. Oh, gotcha. So it's like hemorrhagic. Gotcha. Yeah, hemorrhagic. Yeah, she had she had come from an outside hospital, so it had. I mean, I I don't think by the time we saw her, this is probably already infarcted and hemorrhaged. But it's just yeah, interesting case, and incidentally, lymphoma on the other side. Cool. I want to share my screen. Um, okay, so this is a patient with. Okay. Um, there's your T2. Here's your DWI. And then ADC. Uh, and then here's our pre. And then arterial, I know, I'm gonna give you a, uh, 60 seconds. And then we have three minutes right here. Okay, what do you think? First, I was thinking papillary because it was T2 dark, but then it enhanced mm -hmm. and washed out. So I'm yeah. also introducing lipid poor AML. Yes. Great. Uh, so this was resected and it was lipid poor AML. No, it's, I, um, I, so I, I was at SAR and I, uh, 
bumped into Ivan Petrosa and he's doing the clear cell that likelihood score. And I'm like, I, I, I will use it one day when it's validated. Uh, and so I, I learned from talking to him and Matt Davenport that there's going to be a, a paper that's coming soon in, in radiology that validates that uh, likelihood score. And so then I was like, my, my complaint was, you know, sometimes like I had like a few cases where it looked like a papillary, right? And, and then it comes out to be clear cell. Like it, it's just the problem is like it, you know, yes, it works, but then there's always mimics for clear cell. And he made an argument, you know, which is really the basis for this is, right, it's the probability, right? If there's a 50 chance that it could be malignant or it could be benign, then that's informative for the patients because they're going to be the one that's going to make that choice, right? And there's a difference between 50% benign versus, you know, 80% benign or 80% malignant versus 50% malignant. Um, so anyways, that's, that's coming. Uh, and this this patient, you know, happened to read the book, uh, but I've had so many cases that didn't, that just made me kind of um, not have that same level of confidence and always still stick in the clear cell in the differential. This is a good one for a biopsy. So like, so when you, if lipid poor AMLs in the differential, then they can biopsy rather than, you know, so, so Nellie already, I mean, is it, is it typical to have that kind of restriction on that? That was quite, that was quite restricting. I think lipopore ML is restricted. Like that, huh? So it's confounding that way, right? I think we need to pick up, bring up the CCLS algorithm. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't I know. Think, if it's, I, I think don't I, know I, got, I, think I would have got hosed on that one. I actually, I feel on this one, like it, this, this thing where it's dark and then enhances and washes out. That's exactly the situation where I bring up lipid pore AML. And I have yep. had a number that have been biopsy that turned out to be lipid pore AML. So, um, I feel like I wouldn't have been deterred by the restriction here because I would have been like, okay, well, an AML can be densely cellular. It's, it's more, this is a more, um, muscular myo, more myo than like, um, lipid part and it's more angio so it's more angio and myo so i feel like the muscle part it could be restricting and i didn't add um papillary in my ddx i said clear cell or lipid pore ml because papillaries this one enhances and then higher than cortex on arterial and then washes out so papillary enhances in the nephrographic phase uh and so i um so i didn't put papillary in this case in the ddx but at least you put lipid pore ml Oh yeah, that was like my leading differential. It looked like a lipid <laughs> pore. Uh, and then I just happened to put clear cell because now I can't not put clear cell in my DDX, unfortunately. Nice. While Josh is presenting his next case, I'll try to go through the CCLS algorithm for this one. Uh, those are the uh, only two I have for today. Oh, okay, awesome. Nelly, do you have any more or anybody else? No, those are my cases. Okay, I'm going to pause this for a second. Okay, so it does not have macroscopic fat. It is enhancing, it's an indeterminate solid mass. It was hypo-intense to T, uh, the T2 was hypo-intense to the renal cortex. It had- Intense. Intense enhancement. And What's then ADR? Um, it is, like it's basically if it's more or less than the renal cortex, what was yours? More. So if it's more than the renal cortex, then voila, to AML. So then what, what are we supposed to say? Like it's definitive for AML or are we giving a probability? Oh, wait, wait. And then hold on. It says two to three. And then it says, oh, oh then you've got segmental enhancement inversion. No, there's no segmental enhancement. Okay, wait. E, if homogeneous or marked restriction on DWI, then it would move it from a two to a three. What does that mean? What does three mean? Um, the, and then, well, I don't, let me see if he has the, but it's, these are all levels of, yeah, there's all these ancillary findings. So these are all levels. Like one is, um, almost certainly not likely to be quickly or so. I don't have the, um, the, the nomogram, like, Oh, the gotcha. Region. So the higher than like number. five is like almost certainly clear cell four is likely three is like intermediate or something, two is unlikely and one is definitely not or something like that. Gotcha. So it's a Likert scale on a five. Yeah. Like what is the, what is the chance it's a clear cell? Gotcha. So it's a three out of five. Yeah. 
So I, ours would have been a three out of five. If it didn't have the marked restriction, it would have been a two. So you're still in the pretty low category. Okay. Great, that fits. is uh, arterial to delete enhancement ratio. Okay, so how much it enhances and washes out. Right. So it, the more it enhances and washes out, the more likely it's an AML, I guess. But um, to your point, Nelly, um, he like the the hype, T two hypo intense ones can still end up being clear cell, right? That's right. That's why I put, yeah. like add the clear cell now, like on most, if not all, like DDX in these kinds of cases. Yeah. Cool. So I guess if like AML had not occurred to you, and then you're on this thing, you would have gotten there. Somebody's writing in the chat. Oh, Rupa sent it. Oh, cool. The paper by Yvonne. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. See you guys later. Thanks, everyone.